We never know. Oops. So I think we should start because I really think we should have a time for discussion. And uh, we don't have that packed presentations. We'll, we'll Recording see. Recording in progress. Uh, this time because we really want to, 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 um, to join all of you into the discussion that has been happening. Oh, what is here? Can anyone fix this one? Please? It's being recorded. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> so these discussions that we have been um, having for quite a long time, and um, it is what about the, this? All this um, capacity in countries, all these his groups, seventeen his sixteen his groups in countries that actually also cater for other needs of their government. So shouldn't we make this kind of more uh, not sustain sustainable and maybe more strategic thinking about what is e-governance means, digital strategies in countries. Um, so we, we have actually embarked on a new project, uh, <laughs> uh, again, a new project that is actually building capacity on this kind of e-governance for countries that uh, Liv Marti will call um, digital, national digital infrastructure which is actually what we are thinking of when we are thinking about how can we support the digital transformation for government in the global south. We could Leave actually Martibu teach some in the global north a little bit as well, but that may come later when they see the, the glamorous examples from countries. So um, we are embarking on a new project uh, with 10 new uh, PhD students, scholarships that we starting now, 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 we had a meeting yesterday, so yes, we can say now, uh, building capacity on more strategic, uh, conscious digital strategies for e-governance in countries. So this will, in a way, be the topic for today, but we will give examples on how uh, DHS2 has evolved into um, cross-sector. We will have examples of how cross-fertilization between education and health. We knew education is super important, is as important as health in countries. But what was a little bit surprising for me was actually the cross fertilization between health and education, how important that is for decision making in countries, for bettering uh, the digitalization processes in countries. So we will also have examples from that one. You can see it's a long list, as usual, we are many always. Uh, so this long list will not. No, some of us will not talk so much. Uh, me and Pamut, we are just, you know, um, introducing the discussion. Hopefully, if you have some questions, I hope we will have time for discussions. Uh, even after each session, we will try to be a strict timekeeper uh, because this is to be discussed. How can we catalyze DHS2 into new domain? And it doesn't mean that DHS2 want to take over the whole world. Is true. It doesn't. It's more like we will try to see how can we integrate, how can we, how can we actually um, support support the the activities on each level, not only on national. We are going here to to the village level, and I have shown this picture before. It's one of my favorite because at the village level, all these topics are catered by one village committee. Water and sanitation, nutrition, agriculture, health, education is treated in these village committees. So this is actually what we have done as so now, but we are also thinking, hmm, what about climate health? What about, you know, effect of climate changes on all levels? That should also be monitored, taken decision upon, and enable countries to have data-based evidence-based, or not so much evidence, because that's happening, but having data for decisions and, and being able to uh, take the right decisions at any time. So this is just to, to remind us that it's not only on national, it's all the way. And that is what the SS2 is kind of focusing on, is the drilling down to where, we, where the, the action can be made uh, in order to affect uh, situations. 
So um, I will give um, the word over to Pamut. Yes, so now. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Pamud from uh, his Sri Lanka. So I have been involved with uh, some of the work uh, uh, where DHS2 is involved beyond health. So now that we are on to the final day of our academy, a bit sad. Um, you all can recall that we have already discussed uh, during the week of some of the use cases where DHS2 is used outside the domain of health. So uh, in the previous slide, Christine mentioned some of them, including education, where we are having some uh, global movement, where most of the his groups are heavily involved with some countries uh, trying to figure out how we can use DHIS2, where we have a lot of expertise around health, uh, to cater the requirements, education management requirements, uh, not everything about education, but mainly education management requirements that are present uh, all, all over the world. So here you see some of the uh, potential areas where we have identified DHIS2 can be utilized. And we already have some examples where DHIS2 is used already uh, to cater the requirements, the information requirements around these domains. So uh, a bit of a technical perspective uh, on how we are planning to use DHIS2. So uh, we all know like uh, uh, there are various ways of using DHS2. If you joined the interoperability session yesterday, you may have seen like uh, it's not just uh, you install DHS2 and all these sectors start entering data. So we have actually broadly identified two categories, uh, at least when it comes to data capture on how DHS2 is used. So the first would be, uh, we have this domain, for example, it could be climate, agriculture, food security, nutrition, disaster, health, of course, and there could be more in future, where these sectors uh, will directly enter data into the DHIS2. So uh, that means like uh, the, the existing tools such as the data capture, tracker capture or Android capture application can be used to capture data. So they will log in directly into the DHIS2 and will start entering data. And of course, might also use the analytic tools. The other common use case now we are seeing is because now we are not operating on a green field because in all these sectors, there may be existing solutions which are already there and which may have some user base. So in that case, what we already have seen uh, in some of the use cases is that uh, we will have the digital systems, the capture applications, which are already existing, and we will try to uh, integrate them uh, to DHIS2. So we already have some use cases for both the scenarios. And towards the latter part of this session, you will be hearing some uh, country use cases where both these methods are followed. Right. I think... Uh, Let me introduce the, uh, one of the keynote speakers this morning. Uh, Lynn Martin, would have, she's, uh, you met her in the first day, she had the opening. She's a policy director for, for, um, for NORAD, mm -hmm. but she's also the one that are, taking, that are the, one of the, the, the co-chair behind this uh, Global Digital Public Good Alliance. So we will hear um, Lynn Martin's perspective about DHS2 and beyond. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? It's good to be back. Um, I'm amazed at uh, how vibrant people are early in the morning, because I know Kristin is keeping you up late at night as well. Um, so that really makes me think that something great is happening here. Um, I actually covered quite a bit of this on uh, on uh, um, Monday, um, and I'm actually thrilled that I, uh, that is being captured uh, in this session as well. So I'm going to speak to it in a little bit more detail. Um, this is just to um, to uh, mention quickly what this Digital Public Goods Alliance is that I am uh, co-leading the secretariat for. These are the six board members. You'll recognize UNICEF here, um, but also um, iSpirit, which is the Indian think tank that has been very involved in, in the, what has happened on identity payments and data exchange in India, for instance. Um, we have more than 20 members. So these are just the board members. and. We have members uh, among the countries that are here today as well. Um, so both uh, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Rwanda are now member countries of this um, alliance. It's very recent. <laughs> so uh, it's been very recently announced. And India is also a member country. 
what this alliance is about. Uh, it's a recommendation that comes from the UN Secretary General um, in a, a high level panel report that came in 2019. And this is from his roadmap for digital cooperation. And this is just to restate what the definition of digital public goods is. Um, and I do know that um, uh, there are uh, very good uh, perspectives also on the digital public goods standard from many here. So I'm just going to point to that. The standard for the digital public goods is an operationalization of this definition, and it's stewarded by the Secretariat uh, of the Alliance for Digital Public Goods, and it's an open standard which means that it's also possible for you to contribute to it. And we have a process for doing that um, on, uh, on GitHub. So very happy to share back uh, in case there are perspectives. And as you will see, uh, it's, it's a technical standard in the sense that it looks at uh, aspects by design. It does not look at maturity. It does not look at... Uh, implementations. And I know that this is an important perspective, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, what is recommended for countries, for instance, or um, uh, sort of what to fund and support. Uh, and I just want to say up front that I very much agree with that. Uh, but the idea of having a standard that looks more at how a technology is designed is that it also can facilitate new things, innovation, uh, digital technologies to address problems uh, where there are no existing solutions. But I very much agree that maturity is an important aspect of what we choose to recommend and support for implementation and looking at how we can um, validate uh, these technologies because there are many increasingly DPGs. And then there is, as Kristin said, <laughs> <laughs> I would come here to talk about digital public infrastructure. Um, another word that's being frequently used is stacks. That comes very much from the India stack, uh, but there are other stacks as well. Um, they typically include digital identity systems, digital payment systems, civil registries, um, uh, systems for secure data exchange. Um, and the idea is that these are the foundational cross-sectoral enablers that public and private services build on top of, and where vendor lock-in uh, or being locked into proprietary solutions can be particularly damaging because it's sort of um, continuous up throughout the entire system. And it really prevents a diversity of solutions on top. I think what we are seeing when it comes to, um, yeah, so here are just some examples of digital public goods that are, relevant for deployment as digital public infrastructure, because digital public infrastructure is, think of that as what countries deploy. So for instance, in India, you have Aadhaar, which is a digital identity system. In the Philippines, you have Philsys, which is a digital identity system. Um, in uh, Estonia and Finland, you have XROAD, which is the system that has been built out. Aadhaar is not an open source system, the Indian Aadhaar, MOSIP, on the other hand, is a modular open source identity platform that has been inspired by Aadhaar and is open source. It's also been made into a modular generic technology, meaning that it's made for ease of adoption and scale. So just it's just to try to clarify the distinction then between the generic and the implementation. You will see that in the case of XROAD, it's both. XROAD is implemented as digital public infrastructure in several countries. It's also open source. And I know, for instance, that Uganda has leveraged XROAD uh, as part of its own digital public infrastructure, as an example. These other examples here, you probably know some of them. OpenCRVS, I think I saw Sean up there somewhere. Sean knows that very well. It's a civil registration and vital statistics system. Um, which is now uh, gaining more scale uh, through some more support. Open GTP actually uh, emerged in Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis to provide government to person payments for uh, health service personnel. Uh, it is now being adopted by Ukraine as part of uh, providing uh, social protection and, and uh, managing the humanitarian financing flows. And I think that's a pretty fascinating story 
uh, a technology that came out of Sierra Leone, co-developed with UNDP and others, is now being reused by Ukraine. Ukraine is also reusing X-Road uh, as part of its own digital public infrastructure. MIFOS and Modulup are other uh, different types of payments uh, systems. X-Road is for secure data exchange. And you will see that I've listed DHIS2. The reason for that is that, as Pamud very well uh, illustrated, even though DHIS2 evolved and started as a health management information system, it's increasingly being adopted across sectors uh, and for many different use cases. And I think that's what distinguishes a digital public good that has the potential for deployment as part of infrastructure is its generic cross-sectoral relevance. Um, and this is kind of the role I, I see for DHIS2, but also for HISP. And I did uh, touch upon this on Monday as well, but just to go into this a little bit more. Um, so first of all, DHIS2 is in itself uh, very much becoming part of <laughs> the global public infrastructure uh, because it's so adopted uh, for health but also because it's scaling across sectors and it has uh, a generic relevance. That's DHIS2. Obviously, the community and capacity building model, as I also said on Monday, is the most important part of that success. Uh, obviously, there are some personalities involved <laughs> that have stewarded it since the very beginning, but ultimately it's, it's the community and capacity building model in combination with the technology. Uh, as Pamud mentions, increasingly now there are integrations between DHIS2 and other DPGs. And I know that, I mean, I don't know how many requests you get every year for integrations, but I think there are <laughs> uh, many. And they probably come both to the HISP community, the HISP uh, hubs, also to uh, Oslo, to in, uh, individual countries. But there are a myriad of integration requests. And I do think that there is huge potential uh, in these integrations, but as uh, I've heard frequently mentioned and fully agree with, they need to be locally owned. It can't be some international development donor, sometimes donors like Nurad, where I'm based, they feel like they want to recommend something that they think is a brilliant idea from, you know, where we sit. Um, and, and we can't have top-down driven ideas about fantastic platforms. It needs to emerge in a local use case, a local need, uh, but some of these integrations can really make sense. Uh, and I think uh, Pamud can tell some great stories about, for instance, Sri Lanka and about uh, DIVOC and DHIS2 and how things have uh, evolved, but also the complexities involved in doing that because it's not easy and it also costs money. And I think that's another point here. It's the funding to support some of these innovation and integrations uh, because we can't expect DHIS2 and the HISP community to take the cost of doing that uh, all the time. Um, I also wanted to point to how at least my impression, and I tried to stress this, this with Pamud, is that the success ultimately and the impact of DHIS2 and HISP um, is also dependent on digital public infrastructures. Where there are digital identity systems, civil registries in place, it's much easier or other types of uh, other um, uh, or even payment platforms to build on. It's possible to pay health workers. It's possible to uh, target different types of uh, assistance much more effectively. Um, and so I would argue that this sort of uh, e-governance or evolving into more of a sort of digital public infrastructure e-governance comprehensive thinking is also ultimately in the interest of everyone who's working on the HIS2, even if it's from purely a health use case perspective, because um, these other digital public goods that are being implemented will hopefully help strengthen the impact also in health. At least that's uh, what we're taking a bet on from our end. Um, but I think uh, there's some things that need to happen to make that happen. <laughs> and and uh, of course, it's to not, for, not forget the need for technical assistance and implementation support and the whole community and capacity building. So how can we leverage that when we go beyond the HIS2? How can we also leverage the HISP model 
into these other uh, digital public goods and use cases. And also, I really hope we can learn uh, from HISP when it comes to this idea of sharing back. I know there's a code of conduct, but it's not something you're forced to do, right? There's not a legal requirement to share back. My understanding is you're doing it because you're part of a community, because it makes sense, because everyone wants to contribute and everyone is benefiting. How can we infuse that spirit also beyond? Because that has been a key sustainability challenge for other digital public goods. How can we support that ecosystem? What can we learn? And lastly, I think <laughs> no one illustrates better than the HISP community the importance of a long-term perspective, because I think it's the only project in the world I can point to that starts in 1994, uh, <laughs> when I was 16 years old. Um, so uh, I do think that um, it's a lesson learned, particularly, again, I sit in an international development donor. If we're funding things, we can't do this two and three year perspective things. We have to be willing to say that, okay, if we want this model and ecosystem to actually be what happens, to actually be what replaces the old paradigm, then we need to be there for the long run. That is not something that comes easily <laughs> for international development donors. donors. I also know I, there are many government representatives here. It's not easy also for governments in countries to commit to these long-term perspectives. But I really, that's maybe my last statement to encourage that, that we can manage to try to give like 10 year horizons and predictability so that we can actually um, make this paradigm shift happen. Thank you. Thank you, Liv Marte. Um, do, I, do I have some? Yes, I have some. Uh, thank you so much, Liv Marte, because I mean, so these long, long thoughts, that's what we do at the university. So that is actually a key pillar at the university is to uh, have long thoughts and invest in capacity in a lifetime perspective. So, so thank you so much for, for this uh, good introduction. We will now continue with the next keynote speaker. Yeah, we have quite a few, but I mean, super important one, director, uh, Steve. Next slide, please. Anyone that can do the next slide? Yes. Steve, please come up. Uh, he's a director for the DDI, uh, the, um, the, 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 the directorate, no, director for the uh, Department of Data and Analysis, co chair of HDC. Anyone that remember HDC, Health Data Collaborative, <laughs> and also a, co uh, a chair, maybe also a chair of the UN Chief Statistician Committee. So now we will hear more about the the, the, the importance of data. Do you hear it's a kind of, you know, you can start to talk there, but then you will get. Yeah, so thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve McFeely, as you heard, I work in WHO, but what I'm going to talk today about is really more from the Chief Statisticians of the UN perspective. Um, so I'm going to give a long, so Christine wanted a long view I'm going to give you quite a long view because my story is going to start in 1966. And in fact, it starts right here in Oslo. So back in 66, uh, I hope I'm getting this right, Sven, Sven Norboten in Statistics Norway published a paper with a very short title, A Statistical File System. And we use the word seminal paper, I think, too often. But this really was a seminal paper. This paper turned the statistical world upside down. It was the paper that began the, the, the journey in the Nordic countries towards a register-based statistical system, which is really unique around the world. It was highly controversial in the rest of the world. In fact, a, a lot of people thought this paper was heresy. Um, so it really, really shocked the world that we could move away from surveys, that we could move away from census and start using register-based systems. For me, when I read this, I joined the statistics office in 1993. This paper had only been translated into English, but it had a huge impact on me. And when I read it, I really thought like, what the hell is going on? Like that we haven't been doing this everywhere else. So much later on, myself and a colleague, we, we wrote a paper um, and it was really an open letter to the Irish government. We were saying, look, we have to organize the national data infrastructure in the country. Like we are squandering information because there's administrative data 
in every department. It's not been digitized. It's not been properly organized. And we're squandering resource. So really, there was three messages coming out of this paper. First and foremost was this, because what we did is we reviewed all of the, the government strategies and across the strategies, we were reading about seamless government, network government, joined up government. And we were arguing, how do you achieve that if the data aren't seamless and joined up? It, you know, if, if you want evidence-based policy, which they all claim they did, then, and if you want seamless policy, then you have to apply the same logic to the data. The other point that we wanted to make is that everything is interconnected. So each department tend to look at their, their policy in a, in a siloed perspective. And, and this is important for the discussion today around health. Public health, if you really want to, to look at health, you need to connect the data to education. You need to connect it to tax data to look at income. You need to look at environmental information. So health is just a domain in a broader national infrastructure. And I use the word infrastructure very deliberately. If you go to government and you say, okay, we need to put in a new electricity system, government will instinctively understand that means they need to invest in you know, generating the information, storing the infra or storing the, the electricity, transporting the electricity, consuming it. So they understand there's a whole bunch of steps involved, and all of those steps have to be carefully managed and they have to be connected. For some reason, they don't understand the same about data, but in fact, it's exactly the same. Data don't just pop up. They have to be manufactured. They have to be organized. They have to be stored. They have to be transported. So in the same way, when we talk about oil, when we talk about roads, we talk about infrastructure, we need to start talking about data as infrastructure. And in, in a modern economy, in a modern data-driven economy, if we're thinking about data as an asset, then we have to treat it like an asset. It needs to be carefully curated and managed. And this really was the argument. One of the key things we were saying is that in Ireland, we needed three unique identifiers. We needed a spatial identifier. We needed a person identifier. And we needed a business identifier. In Ireland now, we have two of them. We have the locations and the, the people. Not all government departments are actually using those, but but that's another battle. Another battle that we had at the time was actually with the health sector. So the health sector was arguing continually that they needed a special, unique identifier. And we were arguing, no, you don't. There should be one national identifier and you should use it. So, and I've heard this argument repeated in other countries too. So what I would say is if you do have to have a unique or a special health identifier, make sure it can be connected to the other person identifiers in the state. Because again, otherwise you're wasting infrastructure. Um, okay, this came out a little bit lumpy, but when I joined the UN, I, I had done a lot of work in Ireland linking data. When I joined the UN, they, they asked me to, to, to give some examples um, at some regional workshops around the world. And what I very quickly discovered is some of the things that I took for granted as a European statistician didn't exist in other parts of the world. So and effectively, I had to rewrite this, the open letter to the Irish government to try and explain, apart from data infrastructure, you need governance. So we called it a legal framework. If I was rewriting this paper now, I would broaden it and call it governance. And you need institutional coordination. Because an awful lot of what we do is connected by people and people are either blockages or they're facilitators. So you need to find the right person that's going to kick open the door for you. There is always somebody who will do it, but you just have to find them. And in a lot of countries, what we see is these pieces on, the, on, on my left don't exist. And, and this is a lot of the work that we have to do. And again, if you look at the words here, sorry, there's a lot of words, but we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about architecture. And we heard those words earlier in the week. You need to think of data in those terms. Um, they don't happen accidentally. And this is key now as well when we talk about trust. So in more recent times, governance has taken on a new dimension because we're hearing a lot about fake news. There's a key role, if, if data is going to have a role in debate, and, and data, you would hope, and statistics and information would be the, the neutral element in an argument. So both sides can agree on the data, at least. They may differ on the interpretation. 
But again, this is why this stuff around governance is so important, because if the information is contested, then we're really going to get nowhere. So let me take a slight, let's jump off the highway for a second. I'm going to take a little by road for a second. So this is the first of the random walks. This is not only information or the logic of interconnection. It's not only important for analytics. It's also very, very important for advocacy. So I'll give you an example. We've been talking in WHO a lot recently about CRVS. What's interesting for me, com coming from a non-health background and I come into the WHO, the, the whole narrative around C CRVS is around health, which I, I guess is what you'd expect. But in fact, to me, when I look at HRVS, I'm kind of saying, well, it, it's much more than that. I mean, the UN broadly is trying to help infor informal economies formalize. So in, in other words, to increase, increase their tax base, their ability to raise domestic resources. You cannot do that if your population isn't registered, if they don't exist on systems, you can't tax them. So CRVS is much more important than health. It's critical for human rights. If you don't have an identity, and this becomes crucial if you become a migrant, if you're undocumented, then you're in real trouble. I mean, this really affects the outcomes for the rest of your life. So again, we're talking broader than health. Democracy, I mean, how do you run elections if people don't exist? If there's three or four of you exist, there should only be one of you on a, an electoral register. How do you set electoral boundaries? How, how do you know how to distribute the representation in the country if you don't know where your populations are? How do you transfer property and inheritance when people die if you don't know they died? Massive economic implications. How do you plan? If you don't know that, in, in, from a statistical point of view, if you don't know the natural rate of increase, so that there's really only two ways population change, natural rate of increase and migration. If you don't know the natural rate of increase, then how do you plan for hospitals, for education? How do you know where to locate them? And now increasingly with security, with terrorism, with things like that, if you don't know who's in your country, if you don't know who they are, then how do you really plan for security? So. If we take something like as simple as CRVS, which we tend to think of probably in this room as a health issue, I would argue it's something much, much wider. So again, it's this idea that everything is interconnected. The other thing, another side road, is just the world is changing fast. The, the world of data, when I joined the statistics office in 93, we really thought of data as, as numbers, columns and rows of numbers. In my lifetime, that has utterly changed with with the introduction of the internet. Now data are sound, data are images, data are text. So the whole way that they were beginning to develop our analytics to mine information has utterly, utterly changed. And that means that the concept of data itself has changed and that has implications for governance. Now at the chief statisticians level, we've started to really become more and more concerned about governance about what's going on at a global level. So a couple of years ago, we started writing some blogs about what's going on at the, at the global level, who's taken ownership, um, because we see some kind of dangerous dichotomies emerging. So you, you see in, with the open data movement, the open data movement is really focused on public information, but the private sector is completely exempt from the open data movement. So we see this kind of worrying at dichotomy. We see Liv was just talking about public goods. So at the governmental level, we're, we're looking at us, or we're looking at data now as a public good. Statistics are now free. Like 20, 30 years ago, you probably had to pay for statistics from your national statistical office. Now they're free. There's been a seismic attitudinal change. But yet we see at the corporate level, they're now looking at, at corporate assets. Th these are assetized, assets to be monetized. So we're seeing these kind of dichotomies emerging in the data world. So we started publishing these blogs, and at the UN, this is now this this really has reached traction. And in fact, last year, the World Bank that they dedicated their World Development Report to data. I mean, that's an incredible statement. And also, UNCTAD, in one of their main development reports, they looked at trade in data. So the idea of data as a good, as a commodity, being traded, and and what does that mean for development? The UN, 
at the high level, there's a board called the CEB, which is the chief executive board of the UN. These are really the secretaries generals of the UN. They've now become sufficiently kind of interested in this topic. So they, they're preparing for a summit, um, I think in two years time, called the Summit of the Future. And back to kind of what Liv was talking about in a way, they're looking at duties to the future. They're looking at new public goods and they're looking at networked and inclusive governance. So they, they approached the chief statisticians and said, look, we need to look at, at data across all of these domains because we're actually getting a bit alarmed by what's happening. And the reason I'm telling you this, because I think that this is the context that can shape how you think about what you're doing. Um, so just, just last April, in fact, in London, the, the CEB has now asked the chief statisticians to start developing and drafting um, a, new, a, a global um, data compact. I'm not sure what the final name will be, but you may know, just to, to come back to the last talk, the UN is also producing now a new global digital compact. And in fact, the, there's an open consultation is open at the moment that closes in September. So they've, they've asked us to input into that, but they've also asked us to start looking at these types of issues about gaps in data governance, data as a public good, universal data principles, because there's a real gap here. And really, I think the UN has realized that no one is looking at this seriously. And, and this, this has profound risks and opportunities for us. Um, so we jump back to health again now. So if we, if we look at something like health information systems, the other thing I've noticed since I've joined the WHO is a lot of routine health information systems, health information systems, HMIS, is that right? There's all of these terms, but to me, it really doesn't matter. In fact, I, I think the information for health systems or systems for health is nearly a more interesting perspective because we should be taking the broadest view because as I said, everything is interconnected. So even within HIS, from an administrative data point of view, I would include everything. I wouldn't be ruling everything out. And I'll explain why in a moment. So for me, what we want to do is we want to develop systems that are adaptable and flexible. We don't want multiple systems. I would, say, I would argue IT can't solve everything. We need to organize the data as well as the IT. This is a message really for WHO, but for everywhere else too. I think the, the dichotomy of routine and information is a really false and a really unhelpful dichotomy. You need to build systems that can deal with emergencies and not just routine. Um, and this brings me to this one. In, indicators are not enough. I, I'm an indicator skeptic. Indicators have a place. But the idea that we can develop a set of indicators now to prepare us for the next emergency, I think is frankly ludicrous because we don't know what's coming. There's an argument or a saying that generals always fight the last battle. I think statisticians are guilty of the same thing. We're preparing for the next COVID, but it probably won't be COVID. There'll be something else is gonna come. We don't know what it is. So we must have systems that are just flexible and adaptable that when something happens, we can add in variables, we can reanalyze. And the critical point then is capacity. We need systems management capacity and we need analytical capacity. There's no escaping it. There's no easy way out. We need analytical capacity. We need creative minds. We need people who can use the data and just reformulate the data. So I would just please argue, don't get trapped into indicators. They have a place, but they have a limited place. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting and very put a, a shed light on the, on the perspective that is super, super important. The need of flexibility and capacity to to be prepared for new emergencies and also this uh, the, the importance of uh, looking at data at much much broader sense than often are done so this is was super for the cross-sector um, uh, present um, plenary so over to the next it is actually um, learning from health 
which we have done since 94, into the educational sector, but also see how that has happened, that it actually much closer connections between health and education than at least I anticipated, because we are all going to schools. And all our children are going to schools and we really want them to go to schools and we really want the teachers to be in the schools teaching the, our children. So this is actually super important when you come into national digital infrastructure, because if our children are not taught in schools, the, the country will not really, um, um, you know, exist uh, and be a democracy. So over to Monica. Monica is... Um, it, from his Uganda, but also a PhD student within our education, DHS2 for Education project. So I'm very happy to give the word to Monica. Thank you very much, Christine, and uh, good morning to you all. And thank you for the previous um, uh, speakers, presenters. I think uh, it was a very good opening and also ushering in us to share our experience on how we've learned from health and now we are implementing in education and also e-governance. So um, talking about basically the lessons that we've learned uh, while implementing in health. In health, uh, DHIS2 has been implemented in Uganda, I think since uh, 2010. So we have this more than 10 years experience implementing in health. And so building on that experience, we now um, ask ourselves, what, do we, what can we learn from health and adopt into education and also avoid any mistakes that were made during the implementation in health and so that they are not repeated in um, in education. So one of the things that uh, we learned uh, while the implementing DHIS2 for health is that um, the districts were really, really at the center of data management. And so this improved quality, improved data use at district level. So now bringing in DHIS2 for education, we saw the opportunity really to use the district as a center for data management, management of education data, and also at that point now use this data um, to help routine decision making at the district level. So before, before we actually adopted DHIS2 for education, at the district level, you'd find that data was really the district was just a conduit for data down from schools up to the national level. It was a manual process. So the district was really left out in the data management process. But now with this, this has created a potential of empowering the districts to really improve their capacity in data management and also use this data. Then, of course, the districts are very um, close to the schools. They know that the issues, they know the problems at schools, the school inspectors at district level are able to identify which schools have problems and then go and support them. So working with the district really was giving us a, an opportunity to empower these district education teams to really support the schools at that level which was now a best practice also. This was learning from health because in health, it was a best practice that the district health teams go down to health facilities, work with them to improve really uh, the challenges at this health facility. Then um, also we had uh, in health where we have routine data quality assessments because the districts now are really interrogating their data with the DHIS2 for health. So we saw this also as an opportunity where the education teams now would now uh, interrogate their data and in so doing improve the quality really of this education data that is coming in. So this is really a very good um best practice that we are learning from health and actually being adopted in education. And of course, the, the promotion of data use can't be more emphasized. So we are having really increased data use at the district level. We are having this data informing district plans. We are having this data inform um, allocation of resources, advocacy of additional resources to support all the school interventions in various districts. 
So for us, we think that this is a very strong point that we could learn from health and now we are adopting into education. And of course, the um, the, the promotion, the display of this data in real-time dashboards, both at district level and also at the central level, has really increased the appetite for data use. Then, um, as we all know that, of course, there are various many, uh, there are various partners in the education uh, sector, education development partners, different stakeholders, which is the same as uh, in health. So in health, you have all these health development partners, and each partner is really interested in their various need, in their needs, uh, data needs. So you find that with that, each partner maybe would come with their own data collection tools down to facilities or down to, to schools. That was happening. But now while um, uh, adopting DHIS2 for Health, during the implementation of DHIS2 for Health, there was need for harmonization of all these data needs. So we had a harmonization process of all the data collection tools, where now instead of different implementing partners are uh, picking their own data, you have all the data picked in standardized tools, and then this data is entered into DHIS2. And now this uh, enables the partners to really support the facilities to, to enter quality data. So we are all contributing to, to one cause. So learning that, uh, that, that best practice in health enabled us now as we implemented DHIS2 for education to really come together with partners, the Ministry of Education, the Education Development Partners, to ensure that we harmonize these tools, we harmonize the data collection process to avoid really ad hoc that reporting, ad hoc data calls that really burden the school level or the districts in the long run. So this has led to harmonization of our data collection tools. We have the timely data collection tool now that we have. And then also this has really enabled us to engage with these partners to support the scale of this initiative to all the districts in the country. So when everyone is contributing to the same cause, I think resources are more aligned. And then um, the the and then this really increases uh, adoption of the system. So with this as well, learning from health, we've also gone ahead to do a costed implementation plan because in health partners were contributing to a costed implementation plan somewhere uh, uh, assisting with server hostings, data collection, DQS, all these were being uh, contributed to by partners, having human resources. So now this has also now been adopted in education to enable us really uh, organize, harmonize these partners to support the implementation. So, um, of course, like... Um, uh, Liv and uh, the other speakers have indicated that data integration is really key. I think uh, we need to we need to ensure that um, data is integrated. And so this has also been this is a lesson still that we learned from health. And Pamud also indicated that in his presentation. So really, data integration. We can't have like the DHIS to collecting all the data that we need from various areas or having all the population statistics and what. So what we have done really is integrate this data into the DHIS for education. We need data from various areas. We need population statistics. We need examination data. We need um, data from uh, from health. So all this now uh, we use it. All this data now can be integrated into the DHIS for education to allow us really calculate the indicators, the key performance indicators that are going to inform planning and really programming. So that was also something we learned from health. In health, the DHIS for health in Uganda is really used as a central repository, and it draws data from various um, uh, from various uh, subsectors. 
Then, of course, uh, with this integration, we went ahead now to link education data with the health data. And this really has been critical for that su successful implementation of health programs. You find that now um, using our school surveillance data, uh, it's informing uh, the interventions of COVID vaccination. You find that our uh, school enrollment data is informing interventions for health uh, inside, uh, for routine immunization. So really there is data sharing across the different sectors and this has really uh, um, improved interventions in the different sectors. Then um, lastly, I think this has also been shared before during the week. Uh, we've adopted uh, the DHIS2 as a generic platform for e-governance e in Uganda. And um, this here, we are tracking the national development plan. And this national development plan, of course, different ministries, departments, agencies are basically supposed to report report progress on, on the national development plan. So you find that all these different sectors, all the different sectors are contributing or are reporting into the DHIS2. So talking about interoperability, talking about sharing, I think uh, this is a very good use case at national level. And now all the other ministries, the Ministry of Health will readily uh, integrate its data with this system. The education ministry that has also adopted DHS would readily integrate its data with this system. So uh, I think this is an opportunity for also having sharing uh, data from the various sectors and then integrating it in the national development plan system. Then, um, the other thing, of course, that while adopting DHIS2 for education that we really learned was uh, it is a very low cost model. Why? Uh, because we are really leveraging on the DHIS2 community, on the exist existing DHIS2 community, on the capacity that has already built uh, has already been built over the years. So this really has given us um, a, a leverage to really to to now easily implement or adopt DHIS2 in the other sectors, because we are talking about the HISP network, the MOH, the ministry, all the district uh, health teams are knowledgeable in DHIS2. So they are able to work with the education teams. They are able to support them. They are able to, you know, mentor them in order as they adopt this system. So this really has, um, increase the uh, improve the adoption of DHIS2 for education in the other sec uh, uh, increase the adoption of DHIS2 for education so we think really using a mature system which is open source which is generic being adopted from uh, one sector which uh, and it's tested and tried really will give us a low cost model for adoption in the other sectors thank you I think that's where I stop. Thank you so much, Monica. This was super, super, super interesting to hear this story from, from uh, Uganda and the educational project of ours that are creating a lot of enthusiasm around in the HISP groups. Uh, we have another uh, uh, sector as well we would like to report on, and that, that is agriculture and even climate and agriculture. So we will now go into a different domain of agriculture and I will, uh, Tivongi is already here. Uh, Tivongi is uh, from uh, University of Malawi, but also he's Malawi and a former, holds a PhD long time ago. Morning, uh, thanks, uh, Christine. So uh, morning, everyone. So I think just uh, take you through the uh, Malawi National Agriculture Information System use case. So for this uh, implementation, we currently implementing in twelve uh, districts in the in the country with over uh, a thousand uh, tablets. So the idea here is that you know, as you know, agriculture is the the mainstay activity for for our economies. But then there's been noted that there's a, a key need to strengthen uh, processes from data collection to 
communication of the data analysis and uh, dissemination. And then also because agriculture is uh, weather and climate dependent. So for this system, there was that need for having the early warning uh, capability, which is in a way twofold. So there's the one component building from uh, getting weather and climate data, but the other component to this uh, early warning deals with uh, food situation assessment and also uh, monitoring the production within the, the country. And then there's uh, the capability for the trade and marketing. So market information system to enable the country be able to determine uh, trends in, in markets and commodity prices. And then also the community development aspect to look at efforts that are taking place at community level, track those, be able to track, for example, uh, lead farmers and provide uh, appropriate support. And then there are also various tools for livestock and animal monitoring. I will show you a screenshot on one of those uh, shortly. And then there's also the, the component on resource mapping. So because there are various implementing partners, so it's essential that we're able to monitor what projects are implemented, where they implemented, what sort of activities they are supporting, and then also the, the budget lines and the durations for uh, those projects. And then there's the household component because households do receive support from uh, various uh, streams. So it's also essential that we map what sort of uh, support households are receiving so that resources are, are provided uh, appropriately. So for example, at, at the moment what we have is just the daily weather report, but they plans to enhance that with the other streams of uh, weather data, but also because we utilizing the DHI soup uh, platform, we currently exploring possibilities of using the other uh, online services where we can uh, pull weather and, and climate data to also interface with the, the data that, we, that we're collecting because the, the data for, for whether that's being collected is being collected at a community level by agricultural extension workers. So these are community level workers that go to households and provide uh, advice on best cropping practices and everything related to agriculture to the households. But then they also uh, collect this data. I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that within this system, we have uh, multiple streams of, of structuring things. So there's the general reporting structure of organization, like from the lowest level. So at the lowest level, we have what's called a block. And then there's a, a section, a group of uh, blocks, then an extension planning area. Then you have a district and agricultural development division, and then the national level. So this is the, the standard reporting structure. But also within the system, we have embedded uh, the marketing component. So we have the structure for all the markets in the in the country. And then we have the structure for all the weather stations in the country. And then we also have the structure for all the fishing points within the country. So there are these sort of like multiple streams for service delivery and uh, getting the data. And then on the right here, well, uh, that's a tool for food situation assessment at, at household level. So every by week, the extension worker follows a, a sample of households to determine uh, the food insecurity. So this is a protocol that they would run through, uh, checking the size of the household. So behind that, you have a protocol running that would so say, okay, if you have this number of members in the household, then for the next two weeks, this is the food energy requirement for that particular household. And then you check the, the main food source, do they buy or do they grow their own food? And then you check whether they have food in the household or not, and then what types of food. So based on the amount of food they have, then the app does calculate the energy reserve that the household has. And then you also check uh, what livestock they have, market prices for food and, and livestock. And then, and also the amount of money they're able to get and whether they're able to save or not. And from all this, then the app does make calculations to see based on what they require and what they're able to generate either by selling livestock or uh, crops and what they have in the household. Will they be food secure for the uh, next two weeks or not? So, so based on that, then 
appropriate interventions can be taken and if need be the household can can get support and also um, in addition to that as as a key aspect of the system we do have what's called the uh, the household register so the household uh, register forms the the foundation for for work so uh, as a matter of uh, organization all households are supposed to be to be registered so this uh, serves the two functions at least one is that with the work processes at community level the population based workflows like for example where you're monitoring livestock so you'd follow all households that work with uh, i mean that's keep livestock but then for this food situation assessment or for production estimates these are sample based workflows so you do run a sample on the registered household. So by registering all households, then we're able to determine that uh, representative uh, sample. Then the other thing as well is there's the, the component for checking, let's say, what sort of enterprise the household is involved in, whether the household is getting support from NGOs, and if they're getting support from NGOs, what sort of supports they're getting, like in what areas they, they're getting, uh, how many NGOs are they getting support from? So we follow like the, the top three NGOs. And then you also check whether the household is getting support from uh, government linked projects. So this then can also form the basis for determining what sort of support should be provided to households so that resources are uh, provided equitably. Yeah, and then the other component is on livestock. So we have tools for monitoring all dynamics for, for livestock. So births, deaths, uh, livestock being transferred in, being transferred out, given as gifts, livestock stolen. And then based on that, you can determine the increases or decreases for, for livestock and also for other animals, let's say cats and dogs, then you can check whether they've been vaccinated or not and whether the people bitten in as like number what number of people have been beaten let's say and whether you know the uh, animal responsible was vaccinated or or not so with with this work uh, we also are able to generate you know different types of statistics so like with this uh, line chart there what you see are just trends in in market prices for for different uh, commodities and then with the chart on the, on the right. So based on that household uh, registration, then we're able also to check the average land holding size uh, per household to see you know, what size of farming land is, is available. And then from there, you can also form a basis for seeing uh, possible uh, productivity at, at, at household level. So I'll stop there and then I think Zef will continue because we have, we're doing some collaborative work in, in this space. Thank you. Let me uh, thank you, Tivanga. This is this is yet another domain, uh, and I really think it's interesting. You forgot to mention that this is implemented in twelve out of twenty-eight districts in Malawi, covering thirty thousand households. So now uh, over to Seferino, um, Mozambique. Uh, uh, thank you, Christian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Seferino Saujane. Uh, I'm from Mozambique. And um, uh, just like Tiong, apart from being a former PhD student at the University of Oslo, um, I belong to a group of DHIS2 experts that are supporting the Lusophone community in the implementation of DHIS2 um, the, for the Portuguese speaking countries. Um, so, in this process of uh, um, advocating for the use of digital public goods, uh, we end up uh, being uh, being exposed to several uh, uh, stakeholders that are that are working in the different domains. Uh, uh, as example, for, uh, in 2016, for example, we were uh, approached by a group of NGOs that were working with the uh, farmers in in uh, one of the districts in Maput. We called Matutwin. Uh, uh, they requested, uh, apart, they had uh, a, a project that uh, 
they were dealing with different with, with different aspects of the 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 the, the, the agriculture uh, chain value chain and then one of the aspects that we are having challenges was the exposure of the products uh, in a situation where the country was ex uh, exporting goods from south africa while we, within the country we could find several of these districts having products that were not being ex used or even uh, uh, they were not able the farmers were not able to sell their products within the country so together working with this NGO we developed uh, uh, DHIS2 uh, platform or, uh, which allowed uh, both customers and uh, um, the for farmers to expose and then to do the, uh, somehow to share the experience and then share, uh, be able to sell their the, the, the products. Uh, later, uh, I think it was to 2016 or 17, uh, we also had opportunity to work with another uh, group of uh, or, uh, or NGO that was working in another province, uh, in Nampula province. Um, uh, they were also looking for uh, 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 possibilities of uh, having a platform that could be used to share um, uh, uh, specific aspects. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, there were um, accidents were working uh, that are, were happening um, along the railway because people, farmers, they were producing, for example, rice, and then they used to go to the railway, uh, the railway, and then. Uh, um, use it as a mechanism for drying, I think, they, they, they products. And then since the, the, we don't have uh, the railway station in our countries are not like the way we have here, for example, or well, the railway, you have your, it's, it's blocked. If you go there, you, you see that there's a, a kind of uh, barrier that, they allow, that doesn't allow people to cross. For in our country, they just, they are open. You can, people, they can pass them. And then there were a lot of accidents. And then they asked us to also expand that this platform to allow um, uh, the, the, let's say, uh, individuals or even uh, experts uh, in the field to produce some information that could be shared with the, with the, with the farmers, especially with farmers. So we expanded this platform and then allowed uh, the, to, to be able to um, send the notifications and also alerts, uh, as well as uh, sharing some of good 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 practice uh, with the, with related to uh, uh, the production of um, agriculture uh, goods. Um, Later uh, in, in the last years, we have been also seeing several advertisements uh, and also Ministry of Agriculture looking for platforms that could be used to uh, manage data and also because of the, the, the several. Uh, um, uh, disasters that have been happening in, in, in Mozambique. I think mo most of you uh, have seen that. The, the, the government has created what they call the National Institute of uh, um, Risk Management and Control. Uh, and uh, we, uh, one of the, 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 the objective of this um, institute is to uh, have a, a platform that is going to um, uh, uh, be used to, 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 to alert the, 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 the population, the general population, when or before the, 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 the uh, say, disaster happens. In this case, for example, the cyclones, all these things need to be, uh, have, they, they need to be, to have a platform that could be used to, 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 to manage this for this data and also to, to uh, warn the population before it, it happens. So, so um, as part of that, uh, the South Digitals have been also developing the capacity on early warning systems. And uh, we, for this year, we just uh, developed a, a module that is supporting the National uh, Malaria Control Program the, on the early warning system using climate data and also historical data to predict uh, out, outbreaks. This is used by the malaria program in Mozambique. So we are at the moment uh, the, using this expertise and uh, together with the colleagues of Malawi, uh, developing uh, this, extending this platform that we, are, we, we have been developing, uh, as I mentioned, from 2015, 16, to, to also be able to, uh, to uh, integrate. Uh, Monica has mentioned here also about integration. So our idea is here to have an integrated platform that can be used for to, not only for the management of data, also to predict all these aspects that I've mentioned, which are, are linked to uh, to, to agriculture and the climate, and also uh, keep 
the, the, the farmers informed. We know that there are several other challenges that we have been discussing here the whole, the, the, the whole week. We, 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 are, we are hoping to learn from what we, have, where we, are, we are doing, what we are doing in health education in order to, um, um, to help uh, in developing this integrated platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Severino. It's very, very inspiring to hear about all this project that goes on in countries that um, actually adhere to, to local um, uh, situations and local needs in the government. Government. We we have some time to 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 discuss. I mean, uh, we have so much to present always, but we have at least ten minutes plus, uh, depending on your your length of your coffee break. Anyone that would like to ask questions for for any of our presenters or would like to come with some statements of what they have heard, you're most welcome. And it's now. And it's Karin. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Still awake? So I'm Karine from uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. And uh, just uh, really a comment, question, maybe uh, some ideas for, for all the, the panelists. First, great presentation. It's very refreshing. Um, you know, every year I'm coming and every year when, <laughs> beside the last two years, <laughs> every year I'm coming and I'm quite impressed. So it's, it's, it's really nice. Just one word that have not been pronounced uh, during the week is dollars, money, funding. So I know it's not the goal of this week, it's really to present the results. But I think after such uh, presentation this morning, at some point, someone has to say this word, funding, dollars. I heard it a lot in the background, in the corridors. Everyone talked to me about, uh, talk about dollars to me every day when I'm here. But um, just to say, of course, you know, it's low cost. You say this, I think. But low cost, that don't mean no cost. Of course, you know, it's cross-sectoral, but doesn't mean one sector has to support more than another. Of course, it's all about, oh, it's cheap because it's local technical assistance. Does not mean that local people, I don't know what does that mean. Doesn't mean that those local people are not human beings. Doesn't mean they don't need to sleep, they don't need to rest during the weekend, they don't need to have money, they don't need to have to pay, be paid. So of course, I'm not to say that here because if you are here, it's because you contribute. As a, by hand, your brain, your heart, your dollars, your Norwegian crown. But maybe together we can be better in you know, demonstrating the use case, demonstrating the cost effectiveness and be better in fundraising. I think there is a lot of ideas on what can be improved. I will not talk about challenges or weaknesses. I'd say just area to improve. We talk about security, better data use, better architecture, better things, but we need dollars. So let's be better together to go out and call for those dollars. I think now health sectors, the five, six donors that are there, are stretched. Difficult for us to do more, but maybe better we could do more together to fundraise. So I just wanted to say it and let's go back now to the topic and not the dollars. Thank you for that, Karine. Uh, e even the hispers need the salaries, I agree, and sleep at night. Anyone that would like to uh, comment on this or more people in the audience maybe? Because now we are picking the topics for the for the, the the afternoon outing, you know, at Songsman uh, in the sunshine, we will have plenty of things to discuss. And of course, the dollar is one of them. Uh, and we, we uh, I appreciate um, Karin mentioning that health cannot uh, finance all the other sectors. So we are looking for other sectors as well. Prosper, have a comment? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, thank you very much, Karin, for bringing that up. <clears throat> I think at some point we had a comment that where is the money? But um, I, I think from what we are looking at and trying to do cross sector uh, is we trying to build a case that can be funded across. I mean, you know, Gavi's funding immunization, what is the cost of you extending the immunization out to the school and helping the school get that data? So we think we can build a case that we can present, I think, to the donors, even the four that are there right now, to see how this can be. Because you find... You find some countries like UNICEF, you are funding um, health alone, education alone. And if this was integrated, I think it would also be less cost, I mean, it would be cost effective. 
Anyone that? Uh, yep, yep, yep. Yes. Oh, before yeah. you even have a mic. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation, and I think it was really uh, encouraging to see how you're extending the use of DHIS to into these other domains. My question is, what kind of limitations have you seen within the platform itself? that doesn't allow you to respond specifically to these new domains? And how, how have you overcome those? And what is the possibility of actually having separate platforms for these specific um, sectors? Is that in the roadmap? And we did go into JIRA ticket 6,070 or something. Very, very good question. And that has been the topic for the, the, the previous week. We had all the HISP groups together discussing actually these matters. And, you know, it's, it's all about Slack. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not Jira ticket. Uh, anyone would like to come to this? Oh. All right. Uh, thanks for, for the question. So I was like with the uh, that are required, but there are some specifics um, such as like sampling. So I said there are components where you have to do sampling. You can't do that with the platform out of the box. But I think on the other hand, then there's that uh, possibility to extend the, the platform with uh, app, app development. So like in our case, then we developed the, the apps for, for the sampling. And also there are some reporting formats that you couldn't support straightforward out of the out of the box. And then we had also extending that with, with apps for, for doing that. So I think also, and finally, I think another use case is on the, the dual entity tracking. So I think by and large, when you get to the tracker level, you're tracking a single entity, but here you want a household but you also want to track the people inside the household. So, but I think this also is coming up in health because we do have another implementation uh, for community health. And when you get to the community level, then you have to track the household and the members in, inside the household. And I think in some conversations as well uh, on the DHIS2 for education, that, that's coming up as well. The classroom, learners in the, uh, in the classroom. So I think that will be generic and can also be incorporated possibly in the main platform. Thank you. Yeah, just to contribute a bit more, I think, uh, as Christy mentioned last week, we had the uh, HISP week, where like uh, all the HISP groups uh, from all around the globe uh, gathered here. And like, we had so many discussions, uh, very structured discussions, and even in addition to that, some ad hoc discussions. So these are all about the challenges that we are facing while we are using DHS2 for various domains, not, I mean, health plus many others, especially education, because we have so many his groups uh, covering education and we have had uh, so many discussions these two weeks about education. So uh, it's usually like this, right? Before we try to uh, apply DHIS2 for a given use case, I'm talking about outside to outside uh, health domain, we usually consider like uh, whether this scenario matches the DHIS2 data model. If it doesn't work, uh, that's a kind of a big no uh, to use DHIS2 for that given use case. But like when we try to, like we feel uh, DHIS2 is suitable because it uh, matches the DHIS2 data model then we have some challenges, right? So uh, when we start customizing it, we realize, or even before when we are planning, when we are identifying requirements, there are some challenges. So some of these challenges are uh, basically about the DHS2 platform, the core, or some may be about uh, usually the interfaces. I think the, the most demanding thing is the interfaces. When it comes to, for example, education, there are some interfaces or like, uh, I mean, it could be not only digital, like sometimes paper forms that they are used to and we are not really rendering it the same way. So if that's the case, it's it's kind of easy because it's uh, all about uh, building apps on top of DHS2. But when it is some platform challenges, we have identified many. It's uh, most of them are related to DHS2 tracker because like, uh, because now we like aggregate it's uh, I mean it's a, it's a very mature thing and uh, we have some solid use cases so it's usually fits but when it goes to tracker there are some uh, some I mean uh, there's an, a lot of uh, different uh, areas that we have encountered challenges it doesn't mean it is not impossible uh, and and also I mean we try to uh, foresee what is what it is going to be in five ten years time like we are talking about entire populations of countries being registered. 
So when it comes to that, we, again, another thing is about performance. So we have been working very closely with the DHS2 core team to identify them. I'm not going to list out all the challenges, but I just mentioned, I mean, some broad areas. And as you correctly mentioned, we have submitted Jira tickets. And, and also we like, um, I mean, even in the experts launch uh, that we had last two days, we have been discussing how to address them. And that's the second thing. And thirdly, uh, I mean, what we are also trying to do is whenever we feel DHIS2 may not be the ideal or may not be the most efficient, we always try to integrate with uh, other platforms which are already there. So those are some solutions uh, that we have been trying to uh, kind of uh, yeah, work with. And also uh, to, uh, to add, I mean, uh, for those of you that have followed the, the, the app innovation development uh, um, sessions, we are really working hard on how to support innovations and also uh, on um, innovating with apps on top of DHS2, whether it's a custom or, or, or more um, part of the whole global generic uh, community. But it's also that we, in while waiting for Godot, we develop these kind of apps that kind of you can use uh, while we are waiting for this Jira ticket to to you know come through <laughs> the Slack channel. So so there are many ways we are handling, tackling, and handling these kind of needs of that cannot really cater for, for as as we see the platform today. So this is also pushing the. I would say uh, the HS2 as a platform for multi-sector is because always this kind of, um, I think that is a, a also a hint to the DPG Alliance community that how important it is to be having a software platform that is a dialogue with the use cases in countries, because we always need to evolve. We are never, never happy. We are always striving for supporting even more, stretching it even more. That keep this platform alive, relevant, in countries for various use cases. I can see Ula, are you, you want to say something? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> when I'm finished. Uh, but we can have a time. Um, Sky, do you want to say something? Representing the... <laughs> I, I'll take off my mask to speak. Um, I only just want to thank, I think this has been a great, uh, great session. And just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sky Yoden. I'm the executive director of an initiative called Digital Square. And, and we support uh, mature digital public goods, including DHIS2 and Open CRVS, both of which we've talked about today. Um, I think it's been, I've just really enjoyed listening to all the great uh, ways and directions DHIS2 has evolved in response to the demand we're hearing from countries. And I'm really interested um, and also really happy to see so many government representatives here at this session um, and, and hope in coffee breaks and elsewhere to catch up and hear what other needs are you seeing in health and beyond and how could digital public infrastructure, digital public goods and global goods help you get there. Um, that's all I've got, thank you. Maybe you also want to say something, you're allowed, and then, yeah, well, I don't need to run. <laughs> yes, thank you, Christine, and thank you for the presentation. As you know, UNICEF is a, a, a multi-sectoral uh, organization. We have different programs in different areas, and uh, I'm from health, and Suguru and Jambak, my colleagues from education, are here as well. And uh, we do support WASH, uh, social policies, social protection, CRVS, and working on CRVS with the health perspective, but we have colleagues that, you know, work on it on with the children right perspectives, etc. So it was really in interesting to see how DHS2 is expanding, reaching more, more domains and more components. So perhaps next year we're going to have more people from different, you know, uh, sectors in, within UNICEF and quite interesting, but it was also good to share challenges because we know that there are challenges and it's really good to know that they exist and that we are working towards you know addressing them great thank you for uh, commenting why there were so few uh, sectors uh, represented here from ministries it's because we actually just one month ago had a very glamorous uh, dhs2 for education academy with so many people involved and we didn't have any money to sponsor anyone to come to this one. So, <laughs> so we had all the ministries of education connected together for one week in, in Banjul, Gambia. So, um, so that's why 
people are not really here uh, for this one, but next year I think it will be much more com coming together because it's actually more uh, similarities than you anticipate. So yeah, that's the reason why there is no Ministry of Education here because no money, you know. We spend all the money on Banjul talking together. Yeah, so uh, one more update uh, from the HISP week. Uh, so we had a uh, special track session on uh, in the in the HISP week about digital public goods and digital public infrastructure, where we kind of uh, introduced all these concepts to the all the HISPs present, and uh, we also received some comments. So I just want to share one comment uh, uh, with you that that that's kind of like the uh, a summary of the discussions. Uh, so uh, uh, they really appreciated uh, the much the the indicators and the DPG standards that you have, uh, where you have these nine indicators to identify uh, uh i mean out of so many solutions what would really fit uh, uh to the criteria of defining as a digital public good but also uh, uh the the his swell of, of opinion like um if the go the broader goal is to achieve the sdgs it's uh, really crucial that uh, the ministries of uh, like it could be health, education, all these ministries adopt these solutions rather than the individual organizations. And for them to make that decision, it, uh, in addition to this technical criteria about the open source licensing uh, and things like that, I mean, it's a broad list, which is very comprehensive. Uh, you should also have some, I think we have already had this discussion around the maturity model, like uh, to, for you to make that decision, we need to know like what is the support involved how long this solution has been around, uh, whether there is a community who would support it. Like, I mean, if uh, if as a ministry, uh, say like a director, if I adopt this solution, uh, is there any, any, any uh, I mean, uh, support available to build the capacity or at least even this solution will exist after five years. So these are again, some areas because I, I already know like when you select in individual DPGs, you have some in information mentioned uh, at the bottom, but uh, probably like a suggestion coming from our side would be like uh, whether it is possible to include some of these aspects into the uh, indicators. Thank you for that point uh, to remind us again about that one. And uh, I think we could uh, give the word over to Ola now, or if not any burning uh, issues uh, from uh, from the audience. I think uh, the to be continued during the coffee break, during the, the, the social event at Songsvan, uh, to di discuss further how we will overcome all the challenges, also Karin's one, you know, the dollars. <laughs> It's not Karis. It's so good to have someone saying it. We are too polite to say anything. Ola. Thank you, Christine. That's working. We could maybe start by charging for the beer at Songsun today, see if we can raise any money. But um, just a few quick uh, messages. We have a pretty packed and uh, maybe a little bit optimistic agenda for this morning. So we have a parallel session starting 10.30. We have another set of parallel sessions at uh, 11.15. And then we have the very exciting app competition starting in this room, 12 sharp. So I uh, encourage the presenters for the 11.15, maybe to end at 11.55, and for all of you to make a new record on how fast you can actually walk into this auditorium, because it tends to take a bit of time. So we'll start 12 sharp so that we can get through all the program for the very final session, and then hope to have lunch at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you. And I think a big hand for all the presenters for this plenary session. Yeah, one small program change for the parallel sessions. We previously had a session on the community on our schedule, but our, unfortunately our community coordinator was not able to make it because he wasn't able to get his visa in time. So this is now a session about impact stories. Uh, you're welcome to join us and learn a bit about shaping stories for the audience. And we'll be interviewing some people live. So if you want to come and share your story with us, we encourage you to join that session over in Auditorium 2. Thanks. <laughs>